Okay, so today we're going to be rereading parts of chapter one um, and finishing up reading chapter one. You're going to follow along with me on the window or on the computer. Um, yeah, and so just making sure you're following along and listening as we go along. Okay, so when we were reading this book, Animal Behavior, Animal Defense, we started reading chapter one, which is avoiding danger. A cheetah sucks. Skulks, sorry. A cheetah skulks through the tall grass of the African savanna. Head lowered, she stares intently at a herd of gazelles. Her spotted coat blends in with the dry grass, making her nearly invisible as she sneaks up on her prey. The gazelles continue to grace. Between bites of grass, each one snaps up its head to check out its surroundings. Bright eyes scan the horizon. Ears swivel to pick up the slightest sound. Nostrils flare to sniff for the scent of a cheetah, lion, or other hungry predators. Suddenly, a few gazelles snore and stamp their feet. The entire herd goes on high alert. The black bands that ran down the gazelles' sides quiver, passing along the message, Danger! Then, some of the gazelles begin bouncing as if on pogo sticks. They spring high in the air with their backs arched and legs stiff. They land on all fours and then leap again. The cheetah pauses. The gazelles have seen her. It is impossible to launch a surprise attack now. The cheetah depends on one short-lived, startling burst of speed to chase down a gazelle. The gazelles, however, also run fast, hitting speeds of up to 40 miles an hour. They can keep up this speed, this speed much longer than a cheetah can. Their odd jumping behavior, called starting, signals to the cheetah, we have seen you, so do not bother to chase us. We are strong and healthy and can outrun you. Let me make this font a little bit bigger, you guys. Give me one minute, just so you guys can read along with me. There we go. Okay. Here's a little gazelle. I'm going to read the caption for the picture. This female springbok, a kind of antelope, bounces into the air with an arched back and stiff legs. This motion is called starting or pronking. Springbok typically use it to show predators that they are fit and hard to catch. Research shows that cheetahs often avoid hunting starting springbok. So they're looking like this, the cheetah will avoid coming to hunt this one. You see how stiff? Stiff means like very straight. Derechas, las piernas derechas y duras. If the cheetah is lucky, perhaps she will find a gazelle fawn hidden in the grass. However, the fawns have tiny coats and can lie still as a stone for a long time. Plus, the fawn's mothers are careful not to give the cheetah any clues as to where their young are hiding. Like most wild animals, gazelles are always watching out for danger. Most often, that danger is another animal. In this case, a hungry cheetah. Even domestic animals such as horses, sheep, and chickens are on the alert for any threat to their safety. Being alert is the first step an animal takes to defend itself. It is one of the many behaviors that animals use to survive in a world filled with predators. Much of an animal's self-defense behavior comes from within it. Most animals are born knowing how to defend themselves. Scientists call this inborn knowledge instinct. Self-defense. Over millions of years, the many different kinds of species, sorry, over millions of years, the many different kinds or species of animals have developed ways of defending themselves. So I know species means many different kinds, a group of living organisms. I like that the Kindle has like a dictionary when I click on a word. Look at that. How cool is that? And you can find out what it means. Uh, so yeah, species just means that it's a different kind of animal, right? So you have, for example, I'm not ready to give examples. Let me keep reading. <laughs> Animals might use protective colors, sharp spines, and excellent hearing. An animal has its defensive tools at the ready all the time, whether or not it is in danger. They are known as primary defenses. Hopefully this is all coming back to you guys. The gazelle's primary defenses include its horns, its keen senses, and its speed. A gazelle fawn's primary defense includes its ability to lie still in its concealing coat color. An animal's primary defenses are backed up by behaviors known as secondary defenses. The animal uses its secondary defenses when it confronts a predator. 
A gazelle uses secondary defenses when it stamps, stops, and runs away, or if it is caught by a cheetah or other predator. Gazelle fawns use the most basic form of self-defense. Avoid being noticed. Like the fawns, many animals evade detection by hiding, freezing, or blending in with their habitat. This is called crepsis. Crepsis. Crepsis comes from a Greek word that means hidden. So crepsis just means hidden, like being hidden away. Lying, laying low. Oh, Miss Miko has such a problem with that word. This is another way that animals uh, protect themselves, right? Many animals hide to avoid being noticed. Turn over a stone or stir a pile of leaves to reveal a world of hidden creatures. A worm squirming in the sudden burst of light, a rolled up pill bug, a centipede quickly scurrying out of sight, <laughs> tiny springtails, and even tinier mites. Trees and other plants harbor animals seeking hideaways. Insects hide under leaves, along stems, and under scraps of bark. Pale trails winding through a leaf show where the larva or young of various moths and beetles are feeding safely between the leaf's layers. Etchings in a tree spark show where beetles have bored inside to feed on its wood while under cover. Many insects even alter plants to create places to hide. Some caterpillars, oops, some caterpillars roll up leaves and seal them shut with sticky silk. Weaver ants seal leaves together with silk made by their larva, which the adult ant uses as if they were glue sticks. Remember, larva means young. Some insects, including species of aphids, midgets, and wasps, spur plants to grow protective cases. These cases, called galls, are, off, are hard knobs with spongy interiors. As larvae feed on the plant, their saliva induces the growth of these galls. Larger animals also take advantage of the safe shelter provided by plants, rocks, and other parts of their habitat. Birds hide their nests amid grasses, tuck them among branches, bury them deep inside burrows, and conceal them in a tree in tree holes. Staying hidden for many hours is not necessary for an animal that can get to hiding to a hiding place quickly. Many small rodents feed close to their burrows so they can dive into them at the first glimpse of a hawk overhead. Crabs scuttle swiftly beneath stones. The pancake tortoise of East Africa, which has a flat, flexible shell, wedges itself into a crevice between rocks. The turtle braces its legs so that it cannot easily be pulled out of its hiding spot. The chakawala, <laughs> I like that name, chakwala. The chakwala, a lizard that lives in southwestern United States also darts into crevices. Then it inflates its lungs with air so its body swells up, wedging it in place. Hiding by day or night. Many species make use of hideaways only when they are inactive. Raccoons, for example, are largely nocturnal. They are most active at night. During most daylight hours, they are curled up in a tree cavity, a wood pile, or even in an attic, fast asleep. At night, they emerge to look for food. Their meals often include other nocturnal animals such as slugs or mice. As a result of being nocturnal, an animal not only avoids predators that are active by day, but also avoids competing with animals that eat the same food. Two or different species that both feed on insects, for example, can use the same source without competing directly if one is part of the day crew and the other takes the night shift. Of course, some predators are also active at night. A nocturnal moth, for example, may be caught by a bat. The bat, in turn, may be caught by an owl. That's interesting. A life in hiding. A variety of species go to the extreme. They spend most of their lives in hiding. Over millions of years, they have adapted to surviving in habitats that keep them undercover. Many kinds of clams, for example, burrow into sandy or muddy beaches. Some species live just under the surface, while others dig deeply. A large, sorry, some species leave, ju live just under the surface, while others dig deeply. A large clam called a goduk can bury itself three feet below the surface. By burying, a clam protects itself from being washed away by waves drying out in the sun and being an easy target for predators. I also like this about the Kindles. It tells you like what people highlighted in the past, like other people that have read this book. 
And that tells you like a lot of people think this is an important fact. So something important is that what, how do, how by burying themselves, how does a clam protect itself? It helps itself by like being washed up so it doesn't get washed away or dry out or it, by being, um, avoiding to being a, an easy target. It does not leave need to leave its hiding place to find food. Instead, the clam opens its paired shells and reaches up through the sand with a body part called a siphon. The siphon takes in water, which the clam filters to extract particles of food. If the clam senses vibrations rippling through the sand, it quickly pulls in its siphon. Vibrations may mean a predator is investigating its hiding spot. The clam also may burrow more deeply to escape. Some clams can dig quickly. The racer clam can move nine inches in one minute. Other animals find safety in living underground. Earthworms spend much of the day burrowing through the soil. If caught by birds probing beak, an earthworm struggles to resist by being yanked out of the ground. It grabs onto the walls of its burrow with bristles that line its sides. The worm's hind, the worm's hind end also bulges to help clamp it in place. A mole digging through the earth can send earthworms scuttling out of the soil. Moles eat earthworms and even store them for later, biting them and then stuffing them into holes in their tunnels. A mole rarely needs to poke its head above ground. There, an owl, fox, or weasel might pounce on it and kill it and eat it. Yum, yum. Next one, staying still. This is another way that they defend themselves or protect themselves as a primary defense. Um, I forgot to let you know in the previous one, you should be filling out those mental maps that I gave you for these last two sections or three. Okay. So pausing the video, if you need to pause and filling out the mental, mental map for the section, a life in hiding. Staying still. A prey animal that senses danger does not always seek a hiding place. Some species first try another way of avoiding direction, freezing in place. Many predators can easily spot prey in motion, but are less likely to notice a still animal, especially if it blends into the background. A moving rabbit out in the open, for example, is an easy target for a hawk. To avoid being spotted, the rabbit crouches low and freezes in place. Its stillness reduces the chances of it being seen and its low profile makes it look more like a mound of dirt than a round-bodied animal sitting on the ground. Hmm. Escape hatches. Animals dig dwellings underground for many reasons. A den or burrow provides relief from extreme heat or cold. It can serve as a nursery for helpless young. Some animals store food in their burrows. A handy burrow also provides a safe spot when a predator appears. Prairie dogs, which live on the grasslands of the United States, build extensive communities of burrows. This is a burrow right here, this hole, when they make a hole and go underground, called towns. At the sight of a predator, a prairie dog immediately alerts its family and neighbors with a shrill bark. In a flash, the prairie dogs dive into their burrows and out of sight. Their tunnels, which spread far and wide and deep, provide the animals with many hideouts and escape routes. Diggers, such as chipmunks and ground squirrels, also include emergency exits in their homes. That way, there's an escape route if a badger digs up the burrow or a snake slips into it. African mammals called meerkats have hundreds of tunnels called bolt holes in their territory. If a predator appears, they run or bolt into them. Ground squirrels, like this marmot, create dwellings underground in part to hide quickly from predators. Oh, I guess this will not. <laughs> Pray dog. Good thing I read the caption. This one's a chip, a squirrel. No, this one's a marmot. See, this is what you need to read again, you guys. Ground squirrels like this marmot. Oh, a marmot is a ground squirrel. Okay. Create dwellings underground. So this is a dwelling. But of the prairie dogs, their burrows looked at this too. I remember because I was driving through, I don't know, somewhere, and there was a lot of, oh, through the uh, black, black lands, national forest, and there was a lot of holes like this. Uh, and they're like, oh, it's all the prairie dogs that live around here. And I was like, oh, yeah. 
In much the same way, newborn deer lie still among ferns and grasses. While their mothers spend time away from them feeding on leaves, the fawns born without any order that would lure a predator rely on their stillness as well as their spots to avoid detection on the sun-dappled woodland floor. Pronghorn antelope fawns remain still for hours on end lying in tall grasses to escape the notice of coyotes and eagles. The chicks of spotted sandpipers and many other birds also crouch and freeze when danger threatens. Though many crouch and freeze creatures also benefit from coloration that helps them blend with their background, such as camouflage, is not a requirement for the freeze to work. A squirrel, for example, is usually a highly visible animal as it busily dashes along branches or springs across a lawn. Should a dog or other animal threaten it, however, the squirrel scrambles up a tree trunk, circles to the side of the trunk opposite of the predator, and freezes. If the predator follows, the squirrel scurries to the other side of the trunk and freezes again. Using the spiraling method, the squirrel keeps a blockade between it and its attacker, even if the attacker is in incapable of climbing the tree in pursuit. Oh, so much still. All right, hold on. I need to go get you guys from Jim. I will finish reading in a minute. You guys come in here barging all loud. Okay. Next part. Next branch of your mental map. Hiding in plain sight. Camouflage, camouflage, also known as cryptic coloration, is the one size fits, fits all defense in the world of animals. Animals as small as insects and as large as a boldly patterned giraffe towering at a height of 18 feet depend on their cryptic colorations to help them blend in. Colors and patterns may camouflage an animal not only by helping it blend in, but also by breaking up its shape. That way, a predator does not recognize it at first. An animal's coloring can hide the roundness of its body, making it look flat. Colors and patterns also can help hide an animal's shadow. Walking sticks are insects that look like twigs. They are able to blend in with trees to avoid predators. Can you see the walking stick here? Cryptic coloration can be as simple as the sandy fur of a fence fox, which blends with the tones of its desert home. It can be as complex as the camouflage of a giant swallowtail caterpillar, which looks like a bird dropping on a leaf. The fox hides in plain sight, while the caterpillar stays safe by resembling something that does not interest a predator one bit. Many, oh, hold on. Many cryptically colored animals just need to freeze or lie down to be protected, or lie, lie low to be protected. A pointy thorn bug sitting on a stem, for example, looks like a thorn. A grasshopper or katydid that resembles a leaf just needs to sit on a leafy twig to blend in and look like a leaf. San Some animals go one step further and behave in ways that enhance their camouflage. Walking sticks are part of this cast of animal actors. These long, thin insects naturally resemble twigs, complete with sharply bent limbs and bumpy joints. They are closely related to the fantastically shaped leaf insects, which have body parts shaped and colored to look like leaves, right down to leaf veins, nibbled edges, and brown spots of decay. But walking sticks don't just look like sticks, and leaf insects don't just look like leaves. They act like them too. While sitting still, they sway slowly, mimicking the motion of a twig or leaf in the breeze. Leaf insects have been known to dangle from a stem by one leg, as if they were leaves about to drop. If threatened, many leaf insects will fall to the ground, landing on their feet and scuttling away. Other insects imitate plant galls, seeds, and flowers. The African flower, mantis, takes on the coloring of the flower on which it lives. This is also true of the Malaysian orchid mantis, which has legs that look like flower petals. The camouflage patterns on many moths, wings imitate patterns of tree bark and the lichen growing on it. Moths instinctively use this camouflage to their advantage. The pine hawk moth perches up on a tree with its head pointing up. This lines up the stripes on its wing with the bark's furrows. The waved umber moth perches sideways on trees. That's because its stripes run across its wings. 
the sideways perch lines of these strips with the bark's pattern. Among the insects, caterpillars excel at combining cryptic coloration with deceptive behaviors. A caterpillar's job is to eat and grow while avoiding being eaten by birds. A caterpillar must also avoid tiny wasps eager to lay their eggs on it. The eggs hatch into larvae that feed on the caterpillar. A Costa Rican rainforest species of moth caterpillar called Narvacostis limnatis. That sounds very Harry Potterish. Looks like a diseased leaf covered with fungus. Ugh. It adds a rocking motion to its disguise so it appears to be quivering in a breeze. Another caterpillar, the larva of a butterfly called the meander leafwing, crawls to the tip of a leaf after hatching. It eats the parts of the leaf that stick out the other side of the sturdy rib running down the leaf's middle. Then it sits on the rib so that it looks like a bit of nibbled leaf, leaf instead. The caterpillar will continue to eat the leaf over the next few days. It binds scraps of leaf to the rib with silk secreted by its bloody body and hides among them. Insects are stars when it comes to combining camouflage with convincing performance, but other animals also use this tactic. The leafy sea dragon of Australian waters is one example. It has frills that make it look like a bit of a drifting seaweed. The sea dragon also rocks slowly and rhythmically, mirroring the swaying of a seaweed in its habitat. Half a world away, the leaf fish of South Africa, America's Amazon River, floats so slowly on its side. Its flattened brown body resembling a dead leaf drifting in the water, its snout looks like the leaf's stalk. This behavior allows the fish to avoid predators and hunt its own prey without being noticed. Many tree frogs also imitate leaves or other plants of pl or other plant parts. The red-eyed tree frog, for example, snuggles into the curve of a leaf during the day. Its bright green body blends with the leaf. The frog tucks its legs and big orange feet close to its blue and yellow sides so that the vivid colors are hidden. Finally, it closes its bulging red eyes, hiding them under gold-flecked lids. The frog can see through these lids to watch for danger as it naps. Even some larger animals manage to pull off the trick of resembling an object. The puchu, a nocturnal bird of Central and South America, spends the day perched on a dead branch. Its feathers, modeled with, modeled with brown and gray, work as camouflage. The puchu holds its body at an angle that makes it look like just another dead branch. On the other side of the globe, a look-alike nocturnal bird, bird called the tawny frogmouth possesses the same way. Poses the same way. Another bird actor is the American bittern, which lives in wetlands. When it is startled, it stretches its long, thin neck and body and points its sharp bill to the sky. In this position, the streaks of brown running down its breast blend in with the tail. Grassy plants around it. Sorry, I'm going to read that again. In this position, the streaks of brown running down its breast blend with the tall, grassy plants around it. The burden also sways gently, just like the breeze or ruffled reeds. Last section, changing color. I think it's the last check. Is it? No. Second to last. Changing color. This is pretty. Wow. These are really cool. Ptarmigans. I like them. Changing color. Sometimes an animal's camouflage won't work if the habitat changes or an animal travels to another part of its habitat. A number of animals solve this problem by changing color. Some animals change color as the seasons change. Seasons are like winter, fall, summer, autumn. The willow ptarmigan, an arctic bird, which lives in Alaska, well, in parts of Alaska and other parts as well, is mottled brown in summer and blends in with the ground, rocks, and plants. In winter, it is white with a black tail and ne nearly disappears against the background of snow and occasional twigs. In spring and fall, as it molts, molts means it sheds, which means loses its feathers, old feathers and grows new ones, the bird is a mixture of brown and white, just like the patchy snow potted snow spotted world around it. Some animals change color within weeks or days. Many caterpillars 
change color as they grow, shedding a skin of one color to reveal another that can protect them better as they move about more to about more to feed. Crab spiders can change color in just a few days to match the flowers in which they lurk. Bark bugs of Central America grow darker when moistened with water. This helps them blend in with a rain and darkened tree trunks. Some reptiles, fish, and other creatures can change color in just a few hours. Many tree frogs, for example, can go from green to brown. Horned lizards of the southwestern United States can change their brown and gray tones to best fit their surroundings. The flounder, a, fat, a flat bodied fish with its eyes on the side of its head, lies on the ocean floor and takes on the color and texture of the sandy, stony surface in as little as two hours. Here's a ptarmigan. You see how, like, I think here it's starting to grow. It's white, getting ready for winter. So it was brown, this color, so it could blend in during the summer and fall. And they'll be all white in the winter. It says here, the feathers of the willow ptarmigan change color with the seasons. White or winter month, white in winter months to blend with snow and brown or mixed colors in other months to blend with plants and the earth. This enables the bird to often be naturally camouflaged from predators. Other animals work even faster. Many octopuses, cuttlefish, and squids can change color in less than one second. An octopus can change, octopus can change from solid red to multiple colors or even white to match its background. It can also change the texture of its skin to resemble sand or stones. A cuttlefish can make light and dark ripples down its back, reflecting the way sunlight shimmers in water. Masking animals in disguise. Masking animals in disguise. So like they put on like a, a costume or something. Some species push the defense tactics of hiding and camouflage to the max by actually wearing costumes. This behavior is known as masking. The decorator crab found in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. Is there pictures of this? No. The decorator crab found in the Eastern Pacific Ocean is named for its habit of disguising itself. The crab picks seaweed and anemones. <laughs> Anemone. That's where um I think Nemo's parents live in the anemone. Remember? Nemo? Anywho, the crab picks seaweed, anemones, and sponges and puts them on its shell. Bristles on the shell work like Velcro to hold items in place. In this disguise, the crab looks like another weed-covered rock. When the crab outgrows its shell and sheds it during molting, it takes the decorations off its old shell and plants them on its new one. That is cool. So the crab goes in like, oh, I want this kind of color, seaweed and anemone and a sponge and then glues them onto its shell, like a fashionista. I love it. Decorator crabs share the Eastern Pacific with sharp nose crabs, which sometimes stick seaweed on the sharp front edges of their shells. Other species of crabs, crabs crab, disguise themselves too. The camouflage crab, crab of New Zealand adorns its shell and its legs with seaweed and sometimes snacks on bits of it. The sponge crab uses its hind legs to hold a live sponge on its shell. The shell is covered with algae, which has settled on the shell just as it would on stone. Hermit crabs sometimes plant anemones on their shells. Anemones <laughs> have stinging cells in their tentacles, so they provide an extra layer of protection for the crab. In return, the crab takes them to the new feeding grounds, and the anemones can dine on I wonder if I'm saying that correctly can dine on tidbits from the crab's meals. Another species, the anemone crab, has claws equipped with hooks for gripping anemones. <laughs> Any predator that approaches this crab will have the stinging anemones. Anemones? I wonder if that's how you say it. Hold on, you guys. I've been saying anemone pronunciation. Anemones. I was saying it. Anemones. 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 Okay. Anemones. Oh, was I? Like, Any predator that approaches this crab will have the stinging anem anemones waved in its face. 
Some insects also use masking. A wavy lined emerald, emerald caterpillar cuts petals from the flowers it feeds on. Then it attaches the petals to spines on its body and fastens them in place with silk. When the petals wilt, it replaces them. This habit has earned the caterpillar the alternative name of camouflage looper. Other kinds of looper caterpillars mask themselves with flowers, leaves, and bits of bark. The larvae of many kinds of caddis fly mask themselves in camouflage cases. The cases are made out of material from the larva's freshwater habitat. Grains of sand, small stone and shells, leaves, twigs, bits of wood, or pine needles. The materials are bound together with sticky or silky fluids produced by the larva's body. A hooked pair of legs at the larva's hind end hang onto the case of the larva as the larva creeps about in search of food. Hiding, camouflage, and masking help animals avoid predators. Animals' behaviors and bodies have changed over millions of years in ways that help them survive. Scientists call these changes adaptations. The process of change over time is called evolution. Predators have also evolved so they could keep finding prey. When they do, the prey must turn to another form of self-defense, which is what we're going to read now. So these will be the secondary defenses when you start escaping. Okay, so we're done reading this chapter, which was all about the different primary defenses animals have to defend themselves from their predators or danger as well. <sighs> that was a long one. Make sure you finish your work. Gracias.